I think about, you know, the history of education and it was really designed initially, you know, to kind of create workers for the industrial revolution. And it had very specific goals. It was imparting skills and knowledge. Like it was really that, and that compliance. was a, and compliance. And certainly there've been some advances, but we're still kind of stuck in that old paradigm that the learners fixed the job of education. You know, if you think about the learners, a black box, the job of education is to pour content and knowledge and skills into that black box. It's not really to say we can change the black box. And that's what neuroplasticity says. We can actually change the learner. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 232 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Look, if you've been listening for a while, I bet you're starting to see your strengths and dare I say brilliance. So can you imagine what working with me would be like? Look, we love the sparkly and new, so sometimes it can feel like we're all over the place. ADHD women often tell me I am interested in so much. Which of my many interests is the one that I should actually pursue? Well, we have interest-driven brains, right? And hyperfocus. So if we can learn more about who we really are and what's truly important to us, we'll know exactly what we should be hyperfocusing on, and then the sky's the limit. That's exactly what we do in my six-week program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. It includes live coaching with me and a private community of women just like you. And guess what? It's open now. We have two cohorts that are still open for this year. And if you go to the website right now, you'll see the price is $11.94. But I don't want you to buy it at that price. If you're thinking about it at all, Please take advantage of the promotion and get $500 off, but don't wait because things are filling up. You can find out more at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-O-K. And don't forget to use the code podcast SASS, that's S-A-S-S, to get $500 off the program just for being a podcast listener. I would love to have you join us. So now let's get on to our regular programming. You know my purpose. It is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, and that includes you. In our podcast today, we are going to do something very different than what we've done in the past. I don't think I've broken my rule yet that all guests must either be diagnosed or have a family member like a child or husband who is diagnosed with ADHD. But I think that what our guest today is going to talk about warrants me breaking my rule. I am so fascinated by her and what she's done, and so I'm confident that you will be too. I also saw many ADHD traits in the stories that she told about herself 
her childhood, and her mother and father in her book. Traits like hyperfocus, passion, tenacity, empathy, social justice, innovation, problem solving, busyness, and being too hard on yourself. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about how our guest, Barbara Aerosmith Young, came into my radar. One of her staff reached out to me, and I initially thought, oh, this is just another one of those brain training programs. I know um, we had looked at a couple of them for my son, and I was ready to click out of the email, but her TED Talk caught my eye. And so somehow I ended up there, and that then led me to a page that talked about the fact that her program was in over 90 schools around the world. And that got me thinking about my son, who has ADHD but wasn't diagnosed with dyslexia until he was 19 and in college. And of course, what was recommended was the Orton-Gillingham training. And when we were considering this program, what I was told is that Orton-Gillingham works because of neuroplasticity. Kids learn how to read by changing their brain. And so that got me thinking that if that program can change the brain using neuroplasticity, why shouldn't neuroplasticity work to change other parts of the brain that affect other problems in learning? So I bought Barbara's book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain, and the book that uh, she recommended, I believe, by Luria, and I'm sure she'll talk about it. And I've been absolutely fascinated with her and her work and her ideas ever since. So for all of these reasons, I am just beyond delighted to introduce you to Barbara Arrowsmith Young. An innovator and author in the field of neuroeducation, Barbara Aerosmith Young's work utilizing the principles of neuroplasticity is used worldwide to enhance cognitive functioning. Her vision is to put the brain in the education equation. Her work, begun in 1978, is recognized as one of the first examples of the practical application of neuroplasticity to address learning difficulties. Since then, its use has expanded to address those dealing with traumatic brain injury, addiction, cognitive decline with aging, and those who want to enhance performance. Her journey and work is documented in her best-selling book and TED Talk, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain. As the director of the Aerosmith program, Barbara continues to engage in research to understand how we can drive neuroplastic change in the brain to benefit learners of all ages. Barbara, welcome, and did I get all of that right? That, that was really, really Excellent, Tracy. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, breaking your rule and inviting me to speak. I am so passionate about the human brain and its capacity for change and how if we can you know, understand that, we can have much more compassion. We can have insight into our behavior and the behavior of others. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Well, you know I'm thrilled to have you. So let's start with your story, if you will. I often say our best purpose gives meaning to our past, and you couldn't be a more perfect example of that. All right. I, I, I was identified in grade one as having a mental block because this was back in the uh, 1950s. I'm dating myself. And at that time, there wasn't even a concept of, you know, attentional problems, learning difficulties, learning disabilities. Uh, so the diagnosis was a mental block. And being quite concrete and literal as a, a child, I actually thought I had a piece of wood, like, you know, a children's <laughs> block in my head that, was, yeah. you know, made things a little challenging. You know, later on, I, I learned, no, I did not have a block in my head, but I had blockages. I discovered... Um, um, later on that I had parts of my brain that were underperforming and underfunctioning, which was the source of my learning challenges. But certainly in grade one, you know, I my teacher told my mother not to have high expectations for her daughter that um, that I was not going to be very successful. And <laughs> yes, what a <laughs> wonderful thing to tell any child and parent, right? Yeah, well, it felt like getting a life sentence in grade one, a little, little early. So I, I hope I disproved that statement in, in my life. And though she did say that, you know, my schooling would be a struggle, that was accurate. I, I can't think really of a day where going to school was a joyful experience because of the learning difficulties. So that, that was the beginning. I struggled to learn how to read to learn how to write. 
at numbers. Like to me, if you gave me, you know, 17 and 41 to add up, I'd add the four and then the seven and then the one and then the one. Like, you know, it was just, it was random because it didn't make sense. I didn't understand numeracy. I didn't understand number relationships. Uh, you know, I had another difficulty uh, where I was very awkward physically, very clumsy. So I was struggling academically in school and I got put into the turtle reading group. I don't know if the teacher thinks that you don't know, you know, that you don't really want to be in the turtle reading group. Uh, like by, you know, it's kind of obvious what that means. But I didn't excel in sports. So sometimes if, you know, a child is struggling academically, they're good in, in another area. But because of, uh, you know, it was a kinesthetic perception difficulty, I just didn't know where my body was in space. So I bump into things. I was, you know, uncoordinated. So that that was my my beginning. And I think, you know, my teacher and I. Barbara, hmm. was there anything you were good at? I, well, I think as, as I, I developed, you talked about that problem solving, that drive, like that, that, what I call the prefrontal cortex, that executive functioning. I was good. Like, you know, I had no idea where I was driving to, but, but I was, I was, I was, it was sort of, I was, I was driven. And, you know, I, I think, you know, my grade one teacher and I made a kind of a silent pact. So I probably spent half of grade one in the washroom. You know, I, I put up my hand in the washroom and she was kind of happy, you know, if I didn't oh, no. her for a long time. And to be fair to her, she was a new teacher that, again, this was in the 1950s. I was an enigma to her. She did not understand me. And I think in some ways, maybe she felt she was failing at her job because, she didn't know what to do. And I actually, in those days, you know, I got the strap in grade one, you know, that, you know, where you have to put out your hand and you get whacked uh, by, by a leather implement because I wrote everything. So they traumatized you. It was very traumatizing. I, I wrote everything backwards. And then, you know, because I was anxious, my hand was kind of sweaty. So I would smear it. And, mm. you know, my teacher thought, I was doing this willfully. Now, it, it, it was just how I wrote, right? Um, wow. so, so that was that was my uh, my beginning. And my mother, I was very, very lucky in my parents. My mother was an educator. So at lunch, I would come home from school because my school was, I could see it from the window of my house. The living room was right across the street. So I would come home. She would give me flashcards, you know, with letters and numbers. Uh, I would come home after school. So I sort of joked that I became a workaholic in grade one. Mm -hmm. And though, you know, I, I didn't enjoy it at the time, but I'm incredibly grateful that she spent all that energy and effort because I did learn how to read. I learned how to write. I learned how to do, you know, basic numbers and mathematics. And though it didn't address the underlying learning difficulty. So I still struggled with comprehension, understanding things. I was still uncoordinated. However, I could master some of the basic, you know, uh, academic skills. And you asked me if another thing I was really good at. I had an incredible auditory memory and visual memory. So, and then I think because I relied on that so much, I actually enhanced those parts of my brain through my schooling. So I would memorize everything. I would, you know, my routine was if I had an exam, say in science, I would put my science notebooks out on my bed. I would kneel down. I would cry my heart out because I had to drain myself of emotion, kind of put myself in a Zen state. And then oh. I would you know, read the first sentence, close my eyes, visualize it, read the second sentence, visualize it. By the end of the process, which could take many hours, I could close my eyes and go from the first page of my notebook to the last page of my notebook. So then when I wrote the exam, I would try to do a match, like, because I didn't really understand the questions. So I would try to flip through my mental imagery of my notebook to find a match to that question and then put it down on paper. And sometimes I did a really good match. So I'd get a hundred percent. Other times I did a really poor match and I'd get 10%. And my teachers would think that I hadn't really worked for that 10%. Well, I, I worked equally hard to get that 10% as I did to get the hundred percent. It was just, I didn't 
comprehend or understand. So I made a like a misconnection between what was being asked and what I put down on the the paper. So, you know, and certainly I was confusing, I'm sure, to my teachers because there were some things I could see, you know, where I, I was performing very, very well. And then other areas where I was performing, you know, very, very poorly. And something as simple as, you know, in high school when I took typing, because of that spatial sort of difficulty, I didn't know where my fingers were on the keyboards, right? So in, I think it was grade nine, I had to stay in every day for a year after school, you know, to practice typing, right? Eventually, I became a pretty good typist, but, you know, it even affected something like, like typing. So certainly, you know, schooling was a struggle. And, and my father was a scientist and an inventor, um, and he had this belief. He said that, you know, if there's a problem and no solution, he said, it's your responsibility to go out and find a solution. And then he said, if the world tells you you can't do it, do not listen. He said, this is how science goes forward. So, you know, I had my mother and her her belief that, you know, her daughter was going to be able to read and write and do numbers. And my father, who had the belief that, you know, that I, I was going to figure this out and somehow come up with a solution. So I feel like I was set on a quest, you know, very early on to find a solution and an answer to my learning challenges. So that that's sort of uh, my origin story. And so then what happened next? How did you get into what it is that you do today? So I went to university and studied child development. I think all, all of the degrees that I took were really trying to understand myself. <laughs> you know, so in child development, you're understanding how children learn. And then I went to uh, graduate school at the University of Toronto to study school psychology. And that's where, you know, we identify and diagnose individuals uh, that are struggling in school. And it was while I was doing my master's degree that Somebody handed me a book that changed my life. And I, I remember the day, it was August in 1977. And this was that book by Luria, The Man with the Shattered World. And it told the story of a Russian soldier, Leo Zazetsky, who in World War II had a very localized head wound as a result of an injury during the war. And then Luria, who was a brilliant neuroscientist in Russia, was describing what was happening in this man's brain that was leading to his difficulties. And Leo Vizizeski was writing his journal, describing his difficulties. And as I read this man's journal, I thought I could be writing that journal. In fact, I was writing my own journal, you know, in the 1960s, describing my struggles. And we were describing exactly the same thing. And I, I knew I didn't have a piece of shrapnel in my head, but it was that aha moment that actually it's my- You had that wood block. Yeah, that wood block was in there, you know, <laughs> causing, causing some difficulties. But, you know, I thought back to my father's, you know, advice. And, you know, one of the things he said, you know, if you're going to solve a problem, you have to identify the nature of the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, now I knew the nature. For some reason, you know, part of my brain wasn't working at the level that, you know, that it needed to be working at. And it was like everything. Like I was now 26 years old, I think at the time, and I still couldn't tell time. I couldn't read an analog clock. And this soldier was talking about after his injury, he couldn't tell time before he could. But it is much more profound than not being able to tell time. It's, it's the part of the brain that connects ideas and sees relationships. So it's critical for comprehension, for insight. I didn't understand why people did things. Like, I, I had no idea. So I struggled socially because I didn't really understand, like, you know, why is that person behaving in that way? Or can I trust that person? Do they have my best interest at heart? I was vulnerable to con artists, right? So not just affecting me academically, but affecting me, you know, socially, emotionally, and in, in relationships. So this book was huge. And that's why I do, I dedicate my book to Luria, because I feel like I owe him a life debt. He profoundly changed my life through his work. And there's this concept of, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. I had the opportunity to stand on his shoulders of all his knowledge and learning and take that into my work. So now I knew my problem is my brain, but what, what do I do about it? 
And then I was at the same time came across work coming out of Berkeley in the States. Uh, this was Mark Rosenschweig's work. And he was one of the early researchers in the 60s looking at neuroplasticity, the idea that our brain actually isn't fixed, that it can change, you know, physiologically and functionally. And he was doing his work with rats. Um, and he showed that stimulation led to improvements in the brain, like more dendrites, so more uh, synaptic connections, more neurotransmitters, enlarged capillaries, so more blood flow. And those physiological changes um, led to better learning. The rats were more able to learn mazes more effectively. So I thought, okay, if rats have neuroplasticity, surely humans must. Like, I, I you know, it seemed to be kind of obvious. And what they did with those rats, right, is they gave them more toys. Was was that the study? Exactly. More toys to play okay. with, um, like more exercise, uh, even, you know, other rats to play with. So more stimulation, like so, you know, more stimulation in their environment. So to me, it just made sense that we must, as humans, have that same capacity in our brains. So at, at that time, I was in graduate school. And I went to all my professors really excited, saying, hey, I think I know why I'm struggling. You know, so one of their responses was, well, you couldn't be in graduate school and have a learning difficulty because at that time, there was no concept that you could be gifted and have a learning difficulty. So that was my, my first roadblock. OK, thank you. And then the next one they said, and they also said, you know, learning difficulties don't have anything to do with the brain. Like, so, you know, I, What's your you know, kind of to me like? What's your point? Like you you think it's your brain, but that's not the source of learning difficulties. Well, now we know that that is, but at, at that time, this was in 1977, and then they said, and even if they did, let's assume that they did, there's no human neuroplasticity. So you know you're stuck with it. So I remembered what my father said. He said, "Don't listen to conventional wisdom. If the world <laughs> tells you you can't do it." try. Like he, he said, you know, create an experiment. So I was my first, you know, experimental subject. I figured, what do I have to lose except time? I couldn't tell time, right? So, you know, let, let me try. And I had, I had no idea if it would work. So I, I went back into Luria's books, really trying to understand, you know, what is the job of that part of my brain? Because then I would have to design an exercise or an activity that would work that part. Kind of like, you know, you go to a physiotherapist, you've got an injury in a specific muscle, they're going to target that muscle. So I had to figure out how do I target that part of my brain? And I came up with um, an exercise using clocks, not that I wanted to learn how to tell time, which eventually I did, but I wanted to work that part of my brain that processes relationships. And now we have an exercise that goes from like a normal two-handed clock all the way up to 10 hands. And there is no 10-handed clock in the world, but it's processing 10 relationships simultaneously. And that's supercharging that area. So for me, I had my huge breakthrough. I did the level of the twos, the threes, the fours. And it was when I could start to see connections between four elements or four ideas that my world changed. And I knew there was human neuroplasticity because I could now do things that before, with the best will in the world, and I was a really hard worker, I couldn't do. And now I could do it. And I figured the only way that change could happen is my brain now is able to do those things that it really couldn't do before. So then I went back in because I had multiple learning difficulties. There was that one. I had a spatial difficulty. I had a body perception difficulty. I created different exercises for each one of those, went through them. I now know where my body is in space. I don't bump into things. I can read maps. I can construct Ikea furniture from a diagram, you know, like translate that, you know, two-dimensional into three dimensions. I can do organic chemistry because I can build those, you know, molecules. And then I thought, wow, this is this is really good. This has really transformed my life, but that's not good enough. I need to find a way to figure out how can I take this out into the world to benefit others. And then that was the beginning of, of my work. And at this point, I only had 
you know, three programs. We're now up to uh, programs for 19 different cognitive functions. And that was really through working with more and more individuals who had different problems than I did. And I would then go back into Lurie's work. I would read, try to understand, create programs. So it's really been a wonderful evolution working with amazing individuals that have walked through my door here in Toronto and to the schools around the world. So I, I feel incredibly uh, humbled, you know, that I've had the opportunity to do this work and do this learning. Barbara, I find all of what you just said so interesting. Yet, I'm wondering about this idea of brain training. And the reason I'm asking you this is I just picked up a um, the spring 2023 of Attitude magazine, and they have an article in there, is ADHD brain training worth the cost? And they basically come down on, you know, the brain games, the neurofeedback, cerebellar or movement exercises, that there's just not enough information to recommend it as a treatment for ADHD. And we'll connect it to ADHD in a second. But I think that before we do that, I would love to know more about the research and what your response to this article would be. Great question. Certainly for me, I'm a big proponent of research. This work grew out of research, you know, Lurie's research, Rosenschweig's research, so we're very, very committed, and partly because I want to demonstrate scientifically what the outcomes and benefits are of this work, and also I want to try to understand, are there ways uh, we can improve and refine the work? So those are really, really critical in terms of research questions that we've been investigating. So we've been looking at what happens in the brain of uh, individuals with learning difficulties as they go through this work. And we've actually looked at um, the differences in the brains of adolescents with learning difficulties and without learning difficulties. And there's a fascinating pattern. What you see in the brain of somebody with a learning difficulty is there are areas that are underconnected in the brain, so in within and between neural networks, and then parts of the brain are hyperconnecting. So they're they're strengthening their connectivity. And the hypothesis is that those hyperconnected areas are trying to do the job of the underconnected areas, but they really can't because they're not designed to do that job. They're designed to do something else. So what you have is a brain that's working incredibly hard, like much harder than a student without learning difficulties, but less efficiently. And hmm. if about the experience of a child with a learning difficulty in school, that was my experience. I was working much harder than the other students, but with not necessarily the same results. So I found it fascinating when we did that study to say, actually, what's happening in the brain is exactly what's happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then what we see as students are working through this, this program is those underconnected areas start to strengthen in connectivity. Uh, we're doing fMRI imaging, and the hyperconnected areas start to be able to reduce in their hyperconnectivity and start to do what they're designed to do. So you you have a brain that then is working more efficiently, more effectively. And what we also see is often creativity goes forward because now there's energy freed up in the brain to be creative, whereas that energy before was working really hard just to support those areas that weren't working well. So to me, that's really fascinating. So we're seeing the work is making significant changes in the brain. And these are in really important uh, networks. So in the executive control network, which is the frontal parietal, which is one of the networks that's really tied to attention, in the salience network, which is the network that says, what's critical, what's essential, what's relevant in my world that I should be paying attention to. And then in the dorsal attention network, which is what should I pay attention to. And in the default mode network, which is that kind of big picture, creative thinking, uh, that blue sky. Ruminating. <laughs> ruminating. So these four networks, both the connections within the networks and between those networks are, are changing. So that you know, I, I, I hypothesized in 1977 when I started developing this that it was going to change the brain. And now we have the research showing, yes, it is changing the brain. And then 
that's great. So the brain is changing, but what is happening in the person's world in terms of cognition and learning? So we've done research looking at a whole range of um, cognitive measures. So sustained attention, selective attention, visual, vigilant attention, all of those improve at a statistically significant level. Working memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, processing speed, cognitive efficiency, cognitive flexibility, fluid reasoning, like really critical cognitive abilities, which makes sense if we look at what's changing in the brain. And then we look at learning. So what we see for students is they double and triple their rate of learning because now their brain is able to learn efficiently and effectively. They improve in things like comprehension, uh, reading, um, uh, you know, being able to just do word recognition and word reading, reading speed, uh, written expression, receptive language, oral vocabulary. I'm probably missing some spelling, mathematics, not only calculation, like being able to do accurate calculation, but understand concepts in, in mathematics, mathematical reasoning. And then we look at social emotional well-being because that's important as well. And we see things like the students rate themselves as happier, having more self-confidence, uh, having a locus of control because now they feel that they have agency in their life. They can actually affect change. We looked using some of um, Carol Dweck's measures. She's at Stanford, you know, the growth mindset. And we found that these students developed a growth mindset. And what was really fascinating, you know, the students loved this part of the study because they got to spit at the beginning of the study, at the end of the study, because we measured um, cortisol and saliva and we saw a reduction in cortisol. So the brain is changing, cognition is changing, learning is changing, social emotional well-being is changing, and physiologically, the stress hormone is reducing because these individuals are less stressed. I mean, if, if you know you can engage in your world and feel oh. part of your world, you you feel better about yourself and you feel less stressed. Like to me, this is the power of the work. Like I, I believe our brain is is our most important asset. And we now have the understanding that we can change our brains in meaningful ways to then flow through in all of these ways, in our ability to learn, our ability to understand ourselves, to have compassion, empathy. That's another thing we measured changes. And um, we did a study, two studies recently in Australia, one with young adults who struggled with addiction. So they were in a rehabilitation center for drug and alcohol addiction. And we know that rewires the brain in a negative way. And as they went through this program, they were able to more benefit from therapy because they could see connections and relationships and have insight. They could understand the triggers and the things that had led them down this, this path. It was really, really profound. We're going to continue that study. We did another study in Tasmania, young younger students who had had really significant trauma in the very, very early um, stages of their lives. And again, that that has an impact on the brain, right? It, 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 it yeah, reduces cognition. And we saw shifts, really positive shifts in cognition in, you know, their ability to now start to learn because they felt, you know, they understood their world, they felt safe, they could actually learn so there's there's huge application individuals with learning difficulties. We're also doing research now in New Zealand and in Spain uh, in mainstream classes. So these are students not identified with learning difficulties, but you know we all have a brain. We go to school to learn. We learn with our brain. So why don't we put the brain in the education equation? So 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Uh, these students from grades one to grade six are doing one cognitive exercise, and I've picked ones that are developmentally appropriate for their age. So in grade one, they're working on the part of the brain that learns how to write. In grade two, the visual memory for learning, you know, simple patterns for reading and spelling. Uh, grade three, numeracy and quantification. And we're doing research and seeing the benefits that the students that are getting those 30 minutes a day are significantly outperforming uh, students that aren't getting the program on processing speed, selective attention. So there's huge application for this work. Uh, we're just doing, starting a study, uh, I think it's at Vanderbilt, um, uh, looking at long-haul COVID. The 
cases where it's affected the brain fog, like at a really significant level. And I'm excited about what we're going to see there. We're, we've just got a commitment in Madrid to do a study with young offenders uh, starting in the fall. Um, you know, those 14 to 18 year olds that have been identified at risk uh, in the criminal justice system. And I believe if we can rewire their brains, they'll make different choices and hopefully not end up in the actual prison system. So, you know, and with attentional issues, um, we absolutely, we see the first thing that teachers report when this students engage in this program in, in schools is a shift in attention. That's, that's the first observation that, that teachers, like before they see the improvements in learning, is that the students are more engaged and, and they're more focused in their attention because our brain regulates our attention, right? I mean, the prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain that tells you, okay, I've got a goal, you know, in front of me uh, or a problem to solve. Here are the things that I need to bring to bear to solve that. And as we're working towards it, you know, all those distractions that happen, we bring our attention right back to kind of have that laser focus on the direction we need to go to solve that problem. We can stimulate and enhance that part of the brain. And then there's some students where it's, or not students, we work with, I've worked with people up into their 90s. So from age five to 90, there's some individuals that have multiple learning difficulties and have what we call a cognitive load. So it means the brain gets exhausted because it's having to work so much harder and then attention wanders. And as the students or individuals strengthen those parts of their brain, their brain doesn't get exhausted, right? It's, it's processing so they can attend. So definitely we see huge shifts and probably I say 75% of the individuals that come into the program that are on medication to regulate attention at the outset are off of the medication by the end of the program because now their brain is regulating attention. And I'm, I'm not opposed to medication. If it's needed, it's needed. But I think if we, you know, if we have a 75% rate of getting people off medication, it's better if their brain can regulate attention and they don't have to rely on medication. You know, I find that so interesting because my son struggled with medication in high school. It just made him anxious and it really caused a lot of problems. But then in college, he started taking his friend's medication and he's like, mom, I, well, he was telling me I can all of a sudden write. I can literally, you know, write for 12 hours. And I'm like, you couldn't write for 20 minutes before. What is going on? And he tells me, well, I tried my friend's medication and I told him, you, you can't do that. You know, you have ADHD, you can get your own medication. So he did. And he started on Vyvanse. And I don't know, he maybe took it three months, but only when he really needed to study. That's just how, you know, he chose with his doctor to do it. And he came back to me one time and he said, I'm not taking it anymore. And I'm like, well, why? And he said, because now I know what I'm supposed to do, right? So clearly there was some, I mean, neuroplasticity. He learned what his brain needed to do to be able to write these, you know, long papers. And so what you're saying makes so much sense to me that, you know, we can change our brain. And granted, medication was what he, what he was using, but he was also doing the work. And it taught him, oh, these are the steps I need to take. So I'm curious because I know you have a different understanding. Like we're always told with ADHD, it's not a learning disability. But clearly you think in, in several cases it actually is. So can you explain more about that? Absolutely. I mean, I think it, it's the brain that drives it, right? So whether we want to call learning disability or not, it's like, I, to me, it's, I, I go under those labels to look at the cognitive functions yeah. and the level of their performance. And it's complex, right? I mean, currently we can look at 19 cognitive functions and the brain is much more complex than that. But these tend to be very critical ones for um, important aspects of learning. But I would never say that we have the, the complete answer to these challenges. But we're looking at, you know, for this individual, like if, if the prefrontal cortex, like that executive functioning is implicated, it will absolutely impact attention because that's the part of the brain that does it. Do we want to call that a learning disability? We call it, you know, part of the brain is underperforming and we can strengthen that, right? And then, and then the person has 
the ability to, you know, regulate their their attention or this, or it can be an outgrowth of multiple learning difficulties. So it's a consequence of that cognitive load. You know, there's, you know, we know in, you know, this concept of rolling brownouts in the power grid, right, where, you know, sections go offline. It's kind of like the brain, like it can only work so hard for so long and then, you know, sections kind of go offline and then attention wanders. Well, if we can strengthen those functions, they don't go offline. So that's how I, I view it. And certainly, you know, in your son's case, uh, you know, those medications, I, I think of them as neurological energizers in a sense. So they, they can kind of raise if they're, you know, it's a profile of unevenness and say, you know, he struggled with writing. This just brings everything up. Like, so he probably hit a critical threshold where then that cognitive function was strengthened to an extent that then he could perform. And to your point, he learned over time what he needed to do um, to be able to do those tasks. And there is neuroplasticity. So, you know, I've met people as I travel around the world that have created their own (laughs) neuroplastic programs or exercises to improve their brains. I mean, I, again, I would never say my work is is the only example of this. So, you know, he probably he probably switched on parts of his brain mm-hmm. as a result of that experience. And the medication for him was a key piece to allow him to get there. So as I said, I'm not opposed to medication. And if uh, in his case, he found a way to use it for a short period of time and then to be able to do what he needed to do without it. And my works in this kind of similar way is, you know, we, if somebody comes in on medication, we say, don't, don't go off the medication at this point, because it's going to help us have the individual engage with the work, but we will track over time, obviously with the family and with the, you know, medical practitioner to say, we think we're at a point where the person can come off medication. And, and because now the brain is, is doing you know, what it's designed to do, but what it couldn't because there was some underperforming or weak connections in those regions of the brain. And to me, this is what's so promising, like this whole concept of neuroplasticity, like it gives me hope. It makes me feel really optimistic. Like these were, you know, learning difficulties, you know, the definition still in some parts of the world is that it's a lifelong condition. My answer is no. You know, I'm living proof, and we have students all around the world that that are are living proof, and and I'm sure you know people through your work that have found ways, you know, to overcome these. Like it's it's not a life sentence. It's not like you know that life sentence I got in grade one that you know my whole life would be a struggle. And I I think like every once while I try to remember back because now it's been many years since I've done the work. You know, every once in a while I have to shake my head and think. I couldn't be having this conversation like the me that, you know, was pre doing this work. We could not be having this conversation because I wouldn't really understand the questions you were asking. I wouldn't be sure if I'd answered them. Uh, You know, my strategy was, you know, hide out at the back of the classroom and smile a lot and hope nobody asked me anything (laughs) because I didn't understand, you know. So that's why I'm so passionate about spreading the word and the promise of, of neuroplasticity. And certainly there are a number of people that have jumped on the bandwagon who don't really understand the principles. And that's probably where some of this brain training is it's really not targeted. Like there's, um, you know, it is to me, you know, it's good to keep ourselves stimulated, but that's not going to target a specific learning difficulty, right? You, you know, for me, I had to understand what is the nature of the problem And what do I have to do, just like, you know, I was talking about physiotherapy, to target that issue? And that's the difference, I think, in the work that I developed and a lot of other programs out there is they're more kind of a scattergun approach. Like it's like like general stimulation versus very targeted focus stimulation. And mine has to be targeted and focused because I'm I'm addressing different cognitive functions. The program I used for that kinesthetic perception, bumping into walls problem was a totally different program than the one for the comprehension reasoning, um, you know, insight piece, and was very different from being able to construct three-dimensional space. Like they were three totally different programs. 
because I was trying to strengthen three totally different cognitive functions. And that's now, as I say, we have programs for 19 different areas and, you know, and there could be a multiplicity of more, but I've made the decision in my life, you know, you know, so I'm getting older. My goal is really to build awareness for this work rather than focus on creating uh, more programs. And I'll leave that to somebody else to do. So I have to ask you, Barbara, why would, and I, I'm so frustrated with this, which is why I need to ask, why would those in education subscribe to this idea that anyone who's struggling with learning can change their brain and make learning easy for everyone? Because then everyone would be smart, right? And our whole, the whole social construct, the U.S. News and World Report of school rankings, that would all be a bunch of hooey because everyone would then be able to go to the top schools. So is it our current education system that it worked for them? Because when you think about the people who are running it, right, obviously the current system worked for them. So how do we make them even understand that, well, just because it worked for you doesn't mean it works for all kids. And kids who, you know, kids are saying, look, it's not working, it's not working. And then they're labeled as, you know, oppositionally defiant and problem children and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, And sometimes I feel like, you know, banging my head against the wall. I think about, you know, the history of education. And it was really designed initially, you know, to kind of create workers for the Industrial Revolution. And it had very specific goals. It was imparting skills and knowledge. Like it was really... that that compliance. And compliance. And certainly there've been some advances, but we're still kind of stuck in that old paradigm that the learner's fixed. The job of education, you know, if you think about the learner as a black box, the job of education is to pour content and knowledge and skills into that black box. It's not really to say we can change the black box. And that's what neuroplasticity says. We can actually change the learner. We don't have to accommodate. We don't have to change the curriculum you know, to adapt to the learner, because we can change the learner who can then engage with all of curriculum and all of learning. So I, th- I think it's really a paradigm shift that, that to, and that's why I talk about putting the brain in the education equation, because really isn't there, you know, if, if, you know, and I, and I visit schools, really good schools all around the world and passionate educators. And it's, it's just really a paradigm shift to see that that education is not just imparting knowledge and that the learner is not fixed. And I think it will happen. I mean, the fact that I'm in a few schools now where the program is where the educators have embraced it and, and every student is doing it, which then removes the stigma of having a learning difficulty because every child in the classroom is doing a cognitive program to, to stimulate and strengthen uh, you know, part of the brain and the cognitive function. So I think it will happen. It's just, you know, it it doesn't happen quickly. I mean, I've been proposing this for 43 years. I have to remind myself in terms of a paradigm shift, that's that's a short amount of of time. So I I think that that's where we are. And, And, you know, World Economic Forum has listed what they call 21st century skills that the idea is that somebody starting school, a child starting school now, we have no idea what skills are going to be required, you know, when they graduate high school, because the world is changing so rapidly, you know, so they, they put all these think tanks together, like what are these skills? And some are empathy, some are creativity, some are collaboration, obviously numeracy, literacy. And if I look at all these skills, I think it's the brain. This is what underlies everything that they're talking about. So how do we prepare students today for the uncertain future of tomorrow? We change their brains. Like to, so I go out and I talk about this. You know, I'm cautiously optimistic because, you know, 20 years ago, nobody really wanted to listen. Now there are people that are opening the doors and saying, let's, let's try this. And the research we're doing in Spain is actually showing the benefits. And so, you know, I, I think we just have to keep talking about it and provide educators with the understanding of what this this means because you know it's um 
you know, neuroscience is over here in one silo and education is over here in another silo. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to get them communicating, right? And that's what, you know, I've spent 43 years working on. And so I think we'll get there. I just, you know, I didn't think it would be in my lifetime that I would actually see any school taking on what I call the whole cohort model, which is this model of every student doing it. I truly believed when I put it at the end of my book that, oh, wow, this is really bold. And and now there are some schools doing it. So and and we're getting more uptake. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> One of the things that fascinates me, Barbara, is, you know, the minute I I read your book and then I heard about Luria from your book and I ran out and bought the Luria book and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so hard. How did someone and when they used the term mental block, was that basically they were telling your mom and you that you were intellectually disabled? It, I, I don't know quite what. What they were telling my mom and me, because I don't think they quite understood. It, it wasn't, it was, it was, I, I mean, I was called slow. I, I think they didn't know how to position me because, you know, they, they just, I don't know. Well, if you I, had I, some I, really great strengths, right? And so, and it, you remind me a lot of my son. So they would see these flashes of brilliance. And so they're thinking, okay, well, if she's not doing the other stuff, it's because she's not trying hard enough. That, that absolutely. And, and again, this was a lot of years ago. So they're like, now we're much more educated and there's lots of articles and, and more awareness. I, I would say, sadly, a lot of our approaches haven't changed. Like again, when yeah. I go to visit schools, I think, oh, that's similar to, you know, not so, so different in principle from, uh, you know, what I, I experienced you know, color coding and like all, all the strategies. And there's nothing wrong with strategies, but it's more powerful if we can change the brain. <laughs> and then, you know, the the learning goes forward. But how did you get through that Luria book? I mean, and what was it that there's a drivenness about you, clearly? Was it just this drive to figure yourself out and you saw that this was the ring that you could hang on to? It, it was. And it was, I think, it was because of the the journal that Leo Vizetsky was writing, right? Because that was not complex, right? Because mm-hmm. he was he was everything he was describing, like you know he couldn't tell time, he couldn't understand fractions, he uh, you know things like bigger than, less than, you know, is an elephant bigger than a fly, like all those relational concepts. I thought, oh my gosh, like I I can't do these things, like the same things. So it was really in the journal writing that I saw myself, which wasn't complicated. And then I thought, okay, there's really something here. So then I, the determination kicked in. And I don't know how many times I read that book, the Luria part. And then I went out and I got every book that was translated from Russian into English. And I had to go on some bizarre websites to try to find some of these because they weren't widely available. So higher cortical function as a man, problems in neurolinguistics, the working brain. And I would read those books over and over and over again. I would hi- I would use all my techniques. I would highlight in different colors. I would draw diagrams. I'd use my right hemisphere to try to draw pictures, to try to understand the relationships, because I, I knew that this was going to be part of my solution. So I was not going to give up. I was, you know, like kind of that tenacious dog with a bone. Um, <laughs> and, and But it, it was it was painful and it was a struggle, but I knew this is what I had to do. So with the difficulty I had with comprehension, right? And then I, yeah, I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to try. I think, you know, I've gotten to a point where I understand the next step, or I think I do, and let me try it. And that's what led to to this work. And, and um, you know, I, I feel like sometimes people ask, would I have preferred not to have been born with the learning difficulties? And I, I say, I can't say yes to that because that was part of my journey and I would not have created this work if I hadn't been born with that. And if I hadn't been born into the family, like with my father and my mother, who they were and their belief system and their determination, right? So I feel like everything was set in motion, you know, from very early on to lead me on the path uh, to create this work. I love it. So I have a personal question, and I feel like since I've got you here, I get to ask it. (laughs) So I read your book, of course. I took your online test, and 
there's parts that I still don't understand because the things that I struggle with, like there's a lot that I don't struggle with at all, but the things I struggle with, I'm really bad at. So for example, Mm -hmm. the spatial stuff, Mm -hmm. I get lost all the time, but I especially get lost when I'm in nature. I had the mounted patrol came out to, you know, get me at night in Golden Gate Park because I got lost. I was lost for two hours in Central Park. I got off the subway and I walked the totally wrong way. I was supposed to meet a friend for lunch. And I was literally like Forrest Gump. All of a sudden I look around me and I'm in the middle of a marathon or it wasn't a marathon. I'm not sure what it was, but it was this big run, right? With all these people around me and I'm in heels and a handbag and like, what the hell? And then recently I was at the Omega Center, which is this kind of outdoor kind of, um, I don't know if you've heard of it. They have a lot of- Yeah, I've presented there. So Ah, yes, I know. Okay. So, you know, it's in upstate New York near Woodstock. And I was there for five days. I was doing um, part of an EFT training. And by day five, I could finally get back to my room, sort of. So you would say clearly there's some spatial issues, right? Like I have problems reading maps. Yes, yes. I, mean, I that- love the new live view like on Google. But let me tell you what I'm brilliant at. I am a master at sewing and patterns, putting up molding, wallpaper. I can put together desks, furniture, Ikea stuff. I'm great at decorating. I can see the end result so I don't need to move things around and then see they don't fit. So how could I be so spatially inept in one area, but then in the other, I'm actually quite brilliant? That's, that's a really interesting question. Like, I, I wonder the idea, like, do you use landmarks a lot when you navigate or not really? Do you see landmarks? Like, see the, the kind of like, there's different ways that we can navigate spatially. One is having a sense of spatial patterns. And the other is um, kind of creating a spatial map, but through the landmarks. So the visual details of the elements that are there. So you, you just kind of have a picture you just know at the you know yellow house with the red maple that's where I turn right like it, it's it's um like for me I, I can think do, yeah yes I think you've got it like if you tell me turn right go two blocks turn left you know I'm like forget it forget it if I don't write it down forget it versus if I can if I've been there before and I can create landmarks I will remember and then I think I'm pretty darn good but for yeah, example, yeah. in nature, where the hell there are no the landmarks? Like everything looks the same, right? There are no landmarks. So that's probably why nature is so challenging because you don't have the, the spatial orientation, right? Because you're relying more on the, the visual look and the landmarks and there are no landmarks, right? Like one tree, unless, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's some people that can recognize the difference in trees, but that's, they're probably pretty gifted in that area. Yeah. So no. that, that would be the distinction. And that's what I love about the brain and its complexity is those kinds of nuances, right? That, that, you know, you can be really exceptional in one area and it can, it can actually compensate in many cases for the other area, except when you get into the situation like nature where the other just doesn't come into play. So you're solely relying on that piece that, that isn't strong. So, I mean, that's, that's to me, what's so interesting about this work and that, If we can apply it to learners, like, I mean, if teachers could understand this, they would teach very differently. Like if they could understand the, you know, the complexity of, you know, the students that they're actually working with, then, you know, they could adapt the curriculum much more appropriately. And then we can change the cognitive profile. So then ultimately they don't have to adapt anything, but that that's probably what's going on there. You know, yeah. And especially like I've often found, like I've always said, my son was the arbiter of good teachers. Um, The best teachers are those who've been through it, right? They've struggled. Things have not been easy for them because they understand that not every brain works in, you know, this certain way. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Like there's, um, I think it was like uh, Sperry who, he won the Nobel Prize many years ago for his work in the split brain studies that he did, but he, he said, he said, there's more complexity between our brains than all of the physical differences combined. Like our, our like, you know, we look at our yeah. fingerprints, my fingerprints are different than yours. Well, actually our brains are even more different than our fingerprints. Like yet we all come 
to learning, like an education, assuming, you know, learners mostly all are the same, right? And and that's like the curriculum one size fits all. And that's also in some brain training. Like if, if anybody says one size fits all, one program is going to address everything, uh, you know, close that door because the brain is way too complex. There is no one size fits all. So absolutely, like that's what is really, again, part of what I'm passionate about is is helping people understand the complexity and also how it drives behavior. Like the number of times where, you know, I've had a wife say, oh my gosh, my husband is just X, right? And you look at it and realize, well, no, that's just how his brain is wired. So he sees things differently than you do. So if I can have that understanding, then you don't think the person is just being difficult. Like uh, it's, you know, I was in the car with them um, someone who is gifted in that spatial business. So they could see kind of like Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player, because he yeah. could see openings in the traffic before other people could see. So he he could get into those spaces, but his wife was really terrible at that. So she was always white knuckled whenever she was in the car with him because she thought, <laughs> oh my gosh, she's going to crash. She's going to crash because if she was driving, she would crash if she did that. But I explained to her, I said, look, your husband has incredible spatial ability. So you can relax. He's, he's not going to, like, he, he sees those openings. And that made a huge difference, right? You know, she was much more comfortable being in the car with him, but she didn't understand that he had a capacity that she didn't. She just assumed everybody, you know, was going to crash the car if they were behaving like he was. Yeah. So when you talk about spatial, you know, I've often read that as humans and, and animals too, we have this compass inside of ourselves. Like apparently if you look at cows, they're supposedly always pointing north, you know? And I have always felt like I've never had that compass. Like if I'm on an island or frankly not an island, I'm in my house right now talking to you. I could not tell you which way really is north, south, east, west. You know, when I'm on an island, it's even worse. And so is that part of the this whole spatial thing? Is there really such a thing as some people just have this comp or most people have this compass and they can just naturally know which way is which? There there are definitely there there are people that have that. And that's probably actually even a different cognitive function than the two that we've just been talking about, like the, the spatial and the the landmark one. You know, it's it's sort of like, you know, in math, like there's vector analysis and understanding vectors. And so it's actually different. And that's one that I don't currently have a program for. So, <laughs> so I'm never going to, I'm never going to be North. <laughs> Pointing north. That's right. just, just, just buy a compass and carry it with you. <laughs> okay. So I want to talk about the Aerosmith program. And this is my question. My son, I keep going back to my son, and this is probably why I'm just so passionate about what it is that you're doing. He has gone through three neuropsych exams or tests, evaluations, right? One at 12, one at 16, and then again, another one at 19 when he was in college. And they didn't figure out the dyslexia until 19. And I think the dyslexia is more, has been more of a problem, certainly, than the ADHD. He's very good in his executive functions. And that's what always didn't make so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. So you have said that, well, you need to figure out the nature of the problem. And we have been to the best people. I mean, you know, thankfully, we have these resources. I can't even imagine people who, who don't and they're struggling with this and their kids. I still feel like even with these great resources, we still don't know really what the nature of the problem is. You know, here we have a kid who is supposedly gifted in math, yet that is what he really struggles in as far as in school grade wise. And so it is prohibiting him from, you know, going on and doing what it is that he really wants to do. And, you know, he talks about, well, I'll go to grad school, you know, just kind of constantly thinking, well, it'll get better. I'll go to grad school. I'm like, well, what's the point of going to grad school if you still have this struggle? And will you even get into a good grad school? Because you're going to have to take the test that gets you in, you know, so on and so forth. And so my question for you is with the Aerosmith program, can he really figure out what, me too, by the way, it, what is the nature of the problem? Where in the brain is the problem? The, our, our assessment 
looks at those 19 cognitive functions. So if there's something separate from that, then obviously we won't pick it up. But what the, the first level I say to people is either go on our website or get my book and look at the descriptions because they're pretty well spelled out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if in those descriptions, something resonates, either, you know, the parent sees it in their child or the, you know, the individual sees it in themselves, then the program will be of benefit because those are the areas that we work on. The next level is what you just said, is that that questionnaire is, is either, you know, an individual can do the questionnaire for themselves and, or they can do it for their child or, you know, he's obviously a young adult, so he can do it for himself. And if something comes out of that, I mean, obviously it's not as close as the assessment because it's based on, you know, somebody's reporting of their experience. But again, if something shows up there, then it it makes sense to the next step would be to do an assessment, which uh, takes about a five hours. I think it doesn't have to all be done at the same time. And there we're looking at each of those 19 functions. And we can do it now online. That was one of the benefits of COVID, uh, you know, with schools closed down all around the world and we had students, we adapted our program to also bring it online. So uh, now the assessment can be done online. And that will tell us in those those areas, is this a is this area functioning well, or is it a mild, moderate, or severe level of difficulty? And and based on that profile, then the next step is what makes sense to to work on. So that's that's one approach. And I'm always you know trying to make this work more accessible. So then we've also looked at you know there's certain programs like the one that I developed for myself that's it's such a powerful program in terms of reasoning, processing, speed, grasping. It does have a little bit of a spatial component in it as well. Uh, And that one, people can opt in. So they don't have to go through the assessment. They can just, you know, read about it and say, hey, this is something I think could be of benefit. And I think probably every human being could benefit from having better fluid reasoning and perspective taking and, uh, you know, being able to put themselves into somebody else's shoe and insight. So we can go either way, but certainly the assessment, um, a lot of people said, oh my God, this whole learning experience is a user guide to my brain. I wow. you know, understand this. So um, the assessment is very profound and we certainly, you know, I've got a psychometrist on staff in Toronto that, that um, you know, can schedule time in to do it. And you can also before taking that step, if you want, as I said, have your son do the questionnaire. And then there are people in Toronto, uh, Jason Kinsey, who's um, been with me for many, many years. He was first one of my teachers, and then he was the principal. And now his role is to basically talk to people, explain what we do. Um, so, you know, he'd be happy to have a conversation with your son if he's done the assessment and, or the, the questionnaire. And say, did you say this is Jason? Jason, yes. Have you spoken yeah, to Jason? You know, I I met with him, and he was going through the clock thing, and I'm thinking, I don't think I have problems here, but oh my gosh, this is so hard. I didn't yeah. know what he was saying. So yeah, I've I've met him. Okay. So I'm so I'm curious on the assessment. Is that like a typical neuropsych test where you use no. you know whisk or no 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 okay no. And they, like. You know, I was trained in school psychology, so I was trained in all those, like the whisk and the waist and the Buck Johnson and uh, Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, et cetera, et cetera. But what I recognized as I was developing this work that is they they don't get down into the specific cognitive functions. They don't, right? No, they don't. So you know, so and you I've don't read, know what to do, right? Exactly, and I've read thousands and thousands of reports and. I and sometimes walk away and scratch my head. Exactly. Like it's, you know, to say someone has dyslexia, you know, there are nine cognitive functions that go into the reading process. So I can see a number of students with that, that label and each one will have a slightly different cognitive profile. And if I don't understand the cognitive profile, I can't deliver the program that is going to benefit that individual. So that's why, you know, we have people come and say, okay, I just had my child go through, you know, a psychoeducational assessment, can you use that? And I say, we're certainly happy to look at it, but no, we have to do our own assessment mm. because we have to understand which of these cognitive functions are driving the the 
behaviors that we're seeing on the the assessment to know what to work on. So, yeah, no, the, 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 a lot of those measures are what I call composite, like multiple cognitive functions are being called on to perform. So somebody can do well in an area because their area is compensating and it's covering up the area of difficulty. So we have, that's why we have to go under the label and look at, at these functions. Um, no, I, I think what you're doing is, is just absolutely brilliant. So anybody can get an assessment. There's no age limit. No age limit. Well, five is probably the earliest because there's still areas developing. And I think the oldest has been uh, somewhere in their 90s. So to me, as I'm getting older, it's really encouraging that there is neuroplasticity over our lifespan. And we we have a number of people that are doing the program just as they're aging with that cognitive decline, just wanting to keep the brain sharp. Like so, um, but yes, any anyone can um, can do the assessment. And I would say start with the cognitive questionnaire. It's free. It's on the website. It's confidential. And after you've completed it, then if you want to talk to somebody, it, it doesn't have to be at my site in Toronto. You know, we've got on the website, you know, around the world where the program is. So you can always take that questionnaire if there's, you know, program in California or wherever that's closer and have a conversation with them. But you're also, everybody's welcome to have that conversation with us. It's whatever and works. so how much do you charge for the assessment? I think it's 1500 Canadian, which is probably about a thousand US, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's Canadian dollars. I want to get that and I want my son to get it because I just feel like, you know, and maybe that's what we'll do. And then we'll come back and we'll do another. <laughs> well, that, we'll, that, would be, that would be fun. We'll do another episode because that is what has been so frustrating. I mean, what you just said about, yeah, dyslexia. And I'm looking at him realizing he's a great writer, right? He can totally put the information together. Oftentimes, he may not go to written sources. He may go to videos, et cetera. But he can also read if he has to read. And if there's something super interesting, he can read. And he was like the top reader, you know, when he was a little kid. So when we found out dyslexia, I'm like, how? How could it be dyslexia? But I also think that sometimes you can have a little bit of a lot of things, right, that ends up being one big thing. Absolutely. I mean, and that's that's why we say we have to go under the label because I've I've seen individuals identified as dyslexia, and I I say I really don't understand how they come up came up with this this diagnosis because I don't see it. And then when we do the assessment, they don't have the components that mm. really go under that label. And 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 it's not to say anything negative about psychoeducational assessments, you know. And to me, the power is what are the cognitive functions that are driving the behavior that we're seeing in the learning situation that are leading to the struggles? Because that's what we have to strengthen. So that's where we have to start. Okay. And and on the age part, working memory, because, you know, I had these gaps before, but as I've gotten older, and especially, you know, with the ADHD, we know that estrogen modulates dopamine. And so it's kind of that double whammy. And I almost feel like I don't even have close to the same brain as far as working memory. I can't remember anything. So what you're saying is going through, I'm not sure which one of your programs, but it sounds like you have one specifically for the aging brain. That really does make a difference. You can get back a good amount of what you had. Yes. And that's uh, that's that simple relations, the one that Jason showed that's you. That's the and- clock. Yeah. So clearly, no wonder I struggled. Yes. And and what's interesting on, you know, uh, geriatric, like a, a neuropsychological assessments in geriatrics, they use a clock, right? Because they, I mean, they don't really, I don't believe I didn't know that the significance, but it, it is because that part of the brain is kind of what starts to go offline a little bit as we age. So we, we've seen a lot of success and that's the one like now, because that's the one I create for myself. And every once in a while, I go back in and I work on it, right? Just like not not to any massive extent, but I'm thinking, okay, I'm slowing down in my processing. I've got a really important, you know, research meeting. I just need to, you know, zap this this area. And, you know, I'll go in and do an hour or two's work 
And I see the difference, you know, so this very, very powerful program. Okay. So you're telling me I need that damn clock exercise. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Yes. You know, the more I learn, the more I'm convinced that ADHD, learning disorders, anxiety, depression, like they all have different labels, but somehow they're all connected. And then when you add trauma in there, oh my gosh, it just blows everything up. I mean, it's rare, you know, and I I guess they say that with ADHD, depending on what, you know, what you read, anywhere from 20 to 70% of those people diagnosed with ADHD also have a learning disorder. So it all just seems connected to me. Yeah, I think it is because in the areas of, right, it's the brain, it's the brain and the brain underlies learning, right? And attention. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if something is not working there, it, it can lead to, you know, a learning difficulty without attentional difficulties or learning difficulty with attentional difficulties. It just really depends on what are the cognitive functions for that individual that are underperforming, whether there'll be an attentional component or not. This is all just so exciting for people who, you know, it's that learned helplessness. I mean, if you are told when you're five years old, my son was 12, I think, when (laughs) the psychologist came highly referred, supposedly an expert in ADHD, told us that he was too ambitious. So you as his parents, your job, your role is to reduce his expectations so he's not disappointed in life. Oh, my gosh. But if that's what you think, that's what you're going to find, right? And so you're just going to give up exactly what, you know, what happened with you. And so what's so exciting is that, no, that's not true at all. We know now with neuroplasticity, we can change our brains. And now there's actually a way that you can, you can do it. So, Absolutely. And good for you for being a warrior mom who d- didn't take that advice. Yeah, I know. Well, your parents too, right? Yes. Go figure out how it's done, Barbara. So where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? Because I could talk to you forever, but at some point I need to let you go. Yeah. So our website is an incredible resource. It's uh, arrowsmith.ca, www.arrowsmith.ca. And there's just a wealth of, of like, if you like research, we've got all sorts of research. If you like videos, we've got videos. If you like blogs, we've got blogs. And then the other and my TED Talk, which um, sort of in, I think, 12 minutes encapsulates this work. And my book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain, is really each chapter is talking about a different kind of part of the brain. Uh, what happens if you know something's not working there? Uh, what happens as, if it's strong? What happens as it transforms? So I, I think, you know, the first place to start is the website, arrowsmith.ca. Wonderful. And we're going to have all of this in the show notes. And what I, what I want to say about your book is I struggle to read. So I tend to do this combination of Kindle, audiobook, and physical book. And if you saw your book with all the little flags in it, I just found it really easy to read. And I think it's because certainly those of us with ADHD brains, but I think it's probably people in general, more so us, we just have this need to understand ourselves and to figure our brains out. And I think you give such a brilliant roadmap of more information of why we do what we do that I just, I I found it to be a really easy read and so fascinating. So congratulations on that. Well, well, thank you. I wanted to tell it through science and story because story is so powerful. Yeah. And that's what people you like did. to. So thank you. And the story makes the science much easier, kind of like Luria, right? Yes. Yes. So Barbara, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. You have no idea how much I was looking forward to this interview. Uh, well, thank you, Tracy. I mean, I'm just passionate about building awareness for um, this this kind of work for neuroplasticity and how hopeful and optimistic. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, some of my students say to me is at a certain point, they stopped dreaming. They didn't, like, they no longer dare to dream. And I think, you know, what this work does is it gives them the cognitive resources, not only to be able to dream again, but to actually realize their dreams. So 
Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. Oh, that's brilliant. So that's what I have for you for this week. Before I go, don't forget to check out my live coaching program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. There is also a private community with women just like you. And you can find out more information at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-OK. If you sign up now with the code podcast SASS, S-A-S-S, you'll get $500 off just for being a podcast listener. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart-ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.